All right, I'd like to uh, introduce our keynote speaker for the day. Uh, we're very honored to have her join us in Montana. Uh, I know the weather might be a little bit colder than what she's come from, but Ophelia Zapata is the author of the only pedagogical textbook on the Tohono O'odham language, a Papago grammar, a book she wrote as part of the language course she developed some years ago. She is also the co-author of the article Derived Words in Tohono O'odham, published in the International Journal of American Linguistics. Her research and publication also extends into more interdisciplinary fields of language study. She is the lead author of the article, The Condition of Native American Languages in the United States, published in Diogene, and is co-author of the paper for the book, Responsibility and Evidence in Oral Discourse, edited by Dr. Jane Hill. The paper is titled, Miss Patrico's Trip Trouble, the distribution of responsibility in an account of personal experience. Ophelia also contributed the foreword to the book, A Community of Writers, edited by Dr. Yetta Goodman. She has also guest co-edited the journals, the Bilingual Research Journal and the International Journal of Sociology of Language. Ophelia's teachings include regular course on a Tohono O'odham language as well as grammar, as well as general undergraduate and graduate courses on the survey of American Indian languages and the structure of the Otham language. Her teaching, like her research and publications, is also interdisciplinary. She has taught courses for the American Indian Studies Program, the English Department, and the Division of Language, Reading and Culture in the College of Education. Courses there have included a seminar on oral tradition, American Indian literature, and language and culture in education. Ophelia's research and teaching interests are supported by her involvement in the American Indian Language Development Institute, AILDI. She is a co-founder of the AILDI and is currently a co-coordinator and facility member in the institute. AILDI is a summer Institute offering courses to educators and potential educators working with American Indian communities, as well as educators working with multi multicultural publications across the United States. The AILDI has been in existence for 14 years and is currently sponsored by the Division of Language, Reading, and Culture, the American Indian Studies Program and Department of Linguistics. Finally, Ophelia is a poet, writing in her native language. She is the author of two books of poetry, Ocean Power, Poems from the Desert, and Mother Earth Movements. <coughs> she has edited a volume of poetry, Marketed of Jew, When It Rains, and co-edited Home Places, Contemporary Native American Writings from Sun Tracks. Ophelia was also a section editor for the collection of Arizona tribal literature, The South Corner of Time. For 10 years, she served as a member of the Lit Literary Adversary Council Committee for Sun Tracks, a Native American literary publication. She is currently the series editor of Sun Tracks and Tongue Twisting. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker. We're very honored to have her. Dr. Ophelia Zapata. Like the Safatwaju with the NUI, had Jesse Munchao Jira, Yao Pom Chen Yu. Mun 
So it's my pleasure to be here today and I express my appreciation to my friend uh, Jesse for the invitation. Uh, I was here earlier this year um, when it wasn't cold. Uh, and so I'm very happy to be back. I have good friends, longtime friends uh, who are here in Missoula, so I'm always happy. And then of course I have new friends as well uh, here in Missoula, so I'm happy to uh, have been invited um, uh, to today's uh, event, today and tomorrow's events. Um, I am Don uh, Autumn and I'm coming from, uh, uh, as they say, uh, from Don, no, from the desert. Um, Currently, I, I live in Tucson or Chukshon, which is an autumn uh, place. It's now a city, but of course, it used to be an autumn and still is an autumn settlement. And so that's where I live and, and uh, work at the um, University of Arizona. And so I, so I just um, uh, restated that. Um, so I appreciated the. In, uh, uh, the words uh, that Jesse uh, provided you on much of my background. And my work has primarily been uh, through the University of Arizona. Um, and so many of the things that he mentioned is, is just because of my position there uh, at that campus. I have been there at that campus for many, many, many years. I. Uh, went there as uh, to go to school. I, I transferred from a junior college uh, near our home, and uh, so that was my first university experience. And I did my undergraduate degree there, and my master's degree, and my doctorate. And then I got a job there, a temporary job initially for a, a few years. And then I was hired in our linguistics department. and. Um, have been there ever since. And, you know, you never know what, you know, other faculty are saying when they're thinking about hiring somebody. So I think I was just in a unique position with somebody who had a linguistics degree and who was from that area, basically where our language is from, uh, our traditional land and so forth. And so of course it made sense to keep um, you know, the work of the language there at that particular campus. And so uh, I'm sure that that had a lot to do with my, my, my getting that position there. And um, uh, I've been very fortunate to be able to do many of the things that I've been able to do with language um, from, you know, that, that uh, uh, position at the university. And the nice thing about the university is that it is very close to our um, our, our community, the Autumn community, which has uh, several reservations. The closest one to Tucson is only about 15 miles down the road, which is the San Javier uh, community or village. And then the main reservation is about 60 miles uh, west of Tucson. So it's, you know, it's a commutable um, place. So Autumn people shift back and forth from reservation to the city. and for different reasons, go to school and jobs and so forth. So, um, so it's a it's a good place to be with, with regard to, you know, especially language work and so forth. Um, what I thought I would do um, today, because the the conference is a student run uh, by Sacred Roots. Uh, uh, of the organization, um, and I anticipated, you know, uh, students being here. So of course we have uh, students and then community members and so and so forth. Um, what I thought I would do was because I have been involved in language work for the whole 
time that I've been a student, actually, when I was a, an undergraduate student, is when I started working on language, basically my own language. And that's when people were still speakers of the language. That is, you had children going, you know, coming into school that were uh, speaking uh, the language. And this was common in Arizona, certainly was common in Montana, I know all the languages. Uh, here in Montana, many um, many of them uh, shared that kind of, of history, where the language was very much intact in you know the 1960s and 70s and so forth. And um, anyway, but because my work, um, like I said, with language started when I was just a young woman as as an undergraduate student, uh, and like I said, it was just online. And because of where I sit, that is, to me, sometimes I feel like I'm sitting on the top of this pole and I see things happening. And, and then other times I'm in that whole arena, the things that I can see sitting up there. And that's the advantage of being at a university, having, and also being native, having the, the uh, I think, privilege of being able to step outside of what's going on and then also be able to be in the midst of it. You know, being all of them, being Native, I can be with the people. I know what they're going through. I know the issues most of the time or I understand them. I can understand them. Uh, and then I can also step back. I can step back as a researcher, and sometimes I'm required to step back so I can objectively speak about these things. And um, so like I said, I've just had this uh, great experience uh, when it came to language. So I've seen a lot from those two venues. And also, I've seen a lot just because of the time that I've been in it meaning that I admit I've been around for a long time. <laughs> um, so I've just, you know, seen it um, and experienced it as well. And so what I want to do today, and, and it, is, uh, it, can, it can be a, a very long history, but I took out a chunk of time, and it, of course it's not going to be um, um, very detailed. It's just going to be a sketch. And the chunk of time I took out is sort of like um, parts of um, uh, sort of little windows uh, into the experiences and into the events that have occurred with regard to language efforts and also with regard to just the situation of language in general. So I'm not going to go very far back. For some of you who are fairly young, it's probably going to be like ancient history, you know, 1960s, like, you know, when was that? Um, and um, so anyway, so like I said, I'm, I'm just picking chunks of time and come up to the, to, the, to the present as quickly as I can. And this essentially, like I said, is uh, uh, most of it is the span of time that for me as an adult, what I saw uh, occurring with regard to, to language. And so that's why I chose this title, these multiple dimensions. That's what I mean, there's different ways to look at it, depending on where you're at in the events around uh, whether it was language loss or language shift or whatever you want to call it. Um, uh, and then uh, up to the uh, present day. So there's different uh, experiences that people bring to it, different experiences that they've been through um, with regard to the history of either their own language, some of, a, some of which we heard um, today in, in some of the presentations. And many of them resonate with me. The, one of the, the women here this morning that was saying that, um, you know, people in different parts uh, of the same language community all doing different things, but this disconnect happening. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard that over the last 30, 35 years. It's something that's very difficult to, to uh, uh, 
address uh, or even to to try and fix and it is very challenging um, so anyway as a way of beginning um, this kind of journey and I like to that that some of the speakers spoke about journey you know which I think or in the community that's uh, sort of critical you know because your life is, is essentially that and that there's different things that are significant um, in 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 these journeys and uh, anyway so so that's one way that I'm looking at this you know taking these chunks of, of uh, points in time and covering some of the things that have occurred with regard to language and so with that what I'm going to do is start with the beginning of mine sort of my some of my early memories of <laughs> language and um, for those of you that are, are don't know, and again, we were talking this earlier about history and what we know and what we don't know, and what sometimes we present out there and it's inaccurate. Um, and so we have to be careful and and um, be critical of what we put out there because uh, uh, we want it to be as uh, accurate as possible. Anyway, so I want to start with with my uh, one of my my early memories, and the way that I'd like to do this is I'd like to read you a part of an essay that I did a few years ago um, about part of my my life. And what I was going to say is, if you those of you that are not aware of our tribe, the Hanoatam, our land, uh, traditional homeland. Uh, is uh, much of southern Arizona and also extend, extends into southern, northern Sonora, Mexico. And the U.S.-Mexico border it cuts through our reservation, like, and so the tribe is split, like, uh, you know, some of the tribes up here in uh, uh, Canada. Um, anyway, so some of the all of them that came into Arizona uh, for mostly for economic reasons in the 1930s and 40s settled off reservation. You know, and the reason you settle off reservation is because the reservation, the way it's set up, is it, basically traditional lands and villages for certain groups of all of them. And if you're not from that particular village, you can't just walk in and, you know, settle. You just get that's not your home. You're all of them, but it's not your home. And so many of the autumn that came in from Sonora settled uh, in the border towns around uh, the reservation. And our family was one such family. Our traditional home is in Sonora, Mexico. And um, so our parents settled off reservation. They're only about mm, two miles uh, from the northern part of the, the autumn reservation. And even though we were off reservation, it was like a little neighborhood. And every the row of houses that we were in, we were all related. You know, my aunt and uncle lived on this side, and my other aunt and uncle. And so we were all we were like a little village. And um, we were off reservation. If you're familiar with Southern Arizona, it's high agricultural um, economy. And back then, when I was growing up, it was cotton farming. Um, <clears throat> economy that was the big thing and so our parents and many of them did this as well they uh, they did um, farm labor for those cotton uh, farmers and my father did that <coughs> he retired from that kind of work and I've written about that work in essays and, and poems because it is a very different lifestyle than say if you're autumn and you live on the reservation it's a very different experience and so it's a unique experience and um so anyway so um the essay the little piece i'm going to read to you is based in that setting of working in the cotton fields all day and then going home and uh, starting up again the next day. But those, like I said, are some of my early memories of, of uh, language. So first I'm going to read you this piece of the essay and then I just want to make some, some comments. Um, 
about it. While the adults carried out the day-to-day -day labors of the fields, <clears throat> they seemed to remain busy mentally. They practiced the mental exercises of, filt of filtering their memories of songs, ritual oratory, and the images of ceremonial grounds through their minds. They would run it back and forth, back and forth again, much like playing and re rewinding a tape of what they knew. They did this so that they would not be the first ones to forget. They bobbed their heads to the quiet beat and rhythm of songs that they must have remembered, but never sang in such settings as a cotton field. They held this part of the language close to them. They watched each other across the rows of cotton, and on catching, catching one another's eyes, they would give a brief smile, knowing what the other was running through their mind. They knew, especially the men, they knew that they would be called on to sing or pray in one in this one language that was theirs, a language they knew was given to them for this purpose. Now, how do I know that this is what was going on in their minds while they worked? How do I know, or how did I know that the songs were being quietly sung while they did their backbreaking work? I know because at the end of the day, when we sat at our evening meal or sat outside under the stars to begin our rest for the evening, they would talk. They talked and talked into the night. They lay awake unbothered by the long days of labor they had put in. They talked about what they were running through their minds while they worked. My uncle would sometimes sing the song they had been quietly vocalizing. He sang it for all of us in our family circle under the stars. In their talk, they explained things to one another, clarifying for each other, supporting each other's remembrances of certain practices and the rituals. This was their talk that would take them far into the night and then finally to sleep. This is what I listened to in the darkness. As a listener, I was only a distant <coughs> participant I heard everything, but didn't understand everything. I lacked their experience, their knowledge of this ritual life that they had been living since adult, young adulthood. My time would come. I listened and fell asleep to the rhythm of their comforting voices, their quiet, familiar laughter. With the morning star in the horizon, the sun not yet even a dim light, I would be urged to wake. In the still darkened morning, as I prepared to wake, I would hear them talking, talking in the echo of the last of the darkness. Their voices only slightly hoarse from sleep, but simultaneously clear. Perhaps it only seemed that way in the intense quiet of dawn. They would be, they would be still on the, they would still be on the same subject that I fell asleep listening to. They were still repeating things over and over. My sister, isn't this the way our father would say it? Or was it this way? Yes, yes, you had it right the first time. You have a good memory. You sound just like him. This talk in the language that happened all around me as a child, as a young person, it stayed with me. It stayed with me even after I learned the English language, which happened when I was around eight years old. I learned English only after I was put in school. And in that era, English was, the, was only for school since no one else at home had any use for it. I left this language on the school bus when it dropped me off by the road, and I walked home with brothers, sisters, and cousins, all of us shifting comfortably back into all of them. Walking just a few yards to the house, we transformed by the time we reached the front door. This ability to transform enabled me to remain a participant of all the things my language had to offer me while growing up. And the reason I wanted to share that memory is because um, when 
many people spoke the language. Yeah, not just all them, but you know, say the languages up here as well. When people spoke the language, you know, they spoke it, you know, for general communication and so forth. But when you think about it, you know that they were also in their own way doing a lot of language maintenance. They were doing a lot of language documentation. It was all oral at the time. And we know this, or you know this, because singers have to practice what they're going to sing. <laughs> they may not sing it out loud every time. They might be singing it in their head. No more. Storytellers, they don't are always telling the story orally, but they're running it through their head a lot of the time. And that is a part of uh, the documentation in a sense, you know, the oral part of it. And so people were doing that kind of work, you know, language documentation, recording language, practicing language, rehearsing it, and of course, passing it on. And so we think that we're doing, not necessarily something new today, but we think <coughs> we're doing something to benefit the language now because they are endangered by documenting, by trying to maintain certain parts of it or as much of it as possible. Mm -hmm. When it was happening the, all this time, you know, the whole time. And um, so my own little memory that I shared here with you about my uncles and my, my mother and my aunts who worked the cotton fields, that they were practicing their songs. And we have what's called oratory. They're formal speeches that are part of a uh, summer uh, ritual for us. They have to memorize these things. They have to know them. And so, you know, they're practicing them all the time. You don't, like I said, you don't see them. You don't, you know, they don't make a big deal of it, but they're doing it all the time. And only, you know, every now and then, like I said, in the evening, sometimes, you know, our uncle would sing something for them. And they helped each other. They supported each other's memories. And you, you know that people do this all the time. You do it in English, and so you can do it in any of the languages, supporting each other's um, memories and forms uh, of language. So the early uh, uh, activity for me, as I look back, with regard to maintaining the language, documenting the language, was happening with the people who only spoke that language and in an environment where everybody spoke that language you know so so it was going on even before the languages became endangered and it was probably probably something that was going on you know way before then uh, as well so so we're doing, you know, some of this activity now, you know, trying to maintain the language, trying to document it, trying to revitalize or recover it, or, you know, whatever term you want to use. Um, and but we're we're doing it now for for a different reason. But like you said, people have been doing it for quite um, some time. And so I think about it. Think about you know this activity sort of occurring in um, uh, in sort of uh, a different uh, situation in a different time. So anyway, like I said, it was part of a, an essay and uh, based on my, my own um, experience. So, so I'm going to share with you, like I said, some of the different um, <coughs> places of uh, language and language work. And I call it unexpected. I call it, un, you know, uh, uh, sort of multi uh, uh And I think it has to be that way. It can't just be one way. 
Um, and so my, my essay piece that I read to you was, you know, my home uh, experience. Um, and the, uh, one of the speakers this afternoon that was saying, you know, that his, uh, your grandma, you didn't know your grandma spoke until she left, you know, her home. Um, and so, you know, so people have different memories and different experiences of, of, of uh, language and home. And, um, and I guess it's, it's good to know and, and to accept it. And part of it is like <clears throat> one of our other speakers spoke about the, the trauma uh, and the shame of language. So once you know the, you know, the language situation regard, regarding your home, if you know it and accept it, not necessarily make excuses for it, accept it and then move forward. And so it's, you know, I think it's it's important to acknowledge it, you know, no matter what it is. And a couple of, you know, people were sharing some of their experiences um, with language with me during during the break. Um, <coughs> also, early schooling, again, as I told you where, where I grew up, off reservation, and then my parents being from originally from the Mexican side of um, the country at least, um, we had no one in our family ever went to school. No one had the boarding school experience at all. Um, and so my brothers and sisters were the first generation to, to start going to school. And um, all of us, started school only speaking all of them. And we went to a little public school down the road from our, our home. And um, uh, I never thought about it at all, you know, what my experience was going to school and language until I went to the university and I was an undergraduate student. And there was this researcher there, which you found out I was bilingual in all of them and English. And then being at a university as a student, she uh, asked me to be part of a little study she was doing about bilingual uh, students. And one of the questions that stuck with me, I don't remember any of the other questions she asked me from her survey, but the only one I remember was um, what, uh, how I felt um, about not knowing English when I was in an all English speaking classroom. And I had to admit, I had very little memory of that, of not knowing English at all. Not that it was a supportive environment or anything like that. What I remember was those of us that didn't speak English, we just all sat together sort of in the back and almost did nothing all day long because we didn't know what we were supposed to be doing. And and I'm sure that didn't last very long. It just seemed like all year long we just sat in the back. I mean, we went every day and just sat in the back. We <laughs> didn't know what was going on. But eventually, and this is where that, you know, what we now call, you know, immersion. That's what was going on. We were sitting back there and everything around you was in, was in English. And eventually it's, it started to make sense. And so all of us, my brothers and sisters and I, the only English language experience and people we spoke to in English once we learned it was in school. So our first English models and our first English teachers were uh, from the school because no one at home used English at all. And so we were not influenced by all the people trying to speak English, you know, because there's something that happens to your English when you learn from somebody who doesn't speak English very well, and it's very difficult to uh, correct. So anyway, so that early study, uh, that little study I was in, you know, she kind of forced me to, to, to bring back that memory because she, what her, her hypothesis was that I had a traumatic experience of trying to learn English. And I, I didn't. Uh, I, I think because they left us alone 
and they know the teachers didn't know what to do with us and her her way of dealing with us was just to leave us alone and we did minimal stuff in the classroom um but just because of the language uh issue and then, like i said eventually we all learn and i think also too um as i think about it we are our brothers and sisters, we had, you know, we had a big family, our cousins, we were all kind of in the same grade or real close to each other. We just clumped together and we were our own support system and we, you know, helped each other eventually figure out um, English. Um, and so, like I said, probably that prevented it being from being a traumatic experience. Um, and so, watching, you know, and listening to parents and, you know, how they um, talked about language. I mean, not deliberately talked about language, but when they're practicing songs, they're asking each other about songs, about the oratory, about the ceremonial layout of places, those types of things about you know, understanding what's happening to you much later, though, when you're in all English speaking classroom and you understand nothing, you know, sort of paying attention to that as an adult. For me, um, it has been valuable, not only as a researcher, but but personally, you know, I I, I believe I can say that I, I have not had uh, as uh, traumatic experience when it came to, to language. There are other parts, though, that were very traumatic. You know, her, some uh, of you all were talking earlier about the racist, racism that goes on. Arizona is horrible. Montana, you know, the, the different policies you have regarding language now and the funding with language, uh, you know, I think that's very exciting. Arizona is, is, is horrible. It's, you know, I don't know what's going to happen there um, with regard to language uh, and the tribes, but it's not a very supportive setting uh, at all. Um, so there's other parts of it that is definitely traumatic, but from my memory, I think language was not as much so. And I'm, I'm aware only as an outsider of uh, the history of of the traumatic experience from uh, boarding, the boarding school experience. <clears throat> okay, so the chunks of time that I'm talking about, the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, 1960s, you know, elementary school year, 70s, high school, and 80s going into uh, college, at least for me. Um, and one thing that I, I look back on, and even though, like, you know, we were just all of the families stuck out in the desert, things like the civil rights movement and the American Indian movement uh, kind of knocked on our door unexpectedly. Um, and I think because we were off reservation, we were very poor, we were very rural, uh, people wanted to help you. And, uh, you know, those of you recall, there was this whole thing about um, dealing with poverty in America. We were the poverty in America. And so white people and other uh, 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 ethnic uh, groups came knocking at our door wanting to help us. Uh, one of the the unkindest thing they did though one time was a group came and looked at how unhealthy our our living environment was. You know, we, we had an outhouse because we had no plumbing, so we had to have an outhouse. They came and uh, quarantined the outhouse because they said it was unhealthy. And so we're like, well, where did we go? They <laughs> put this big tape on it and stuff, said it was quarantined, it was, we were not supposed to use it. After they left, we took the tape off and kept using it. But, you know, they meant well, but it it was, didn't turn out right. But anyway, those kinds of things um, seem to make an impact. 
And it made an impact on me once I was in high school. And again, just real quick history on my high schooling is um, I was the first one to go to, to high school and, and finish. I had one brother that started, but um, my father told him to stop because he had to go to work. Um, but I, they let me go and, and I finished. And um, uh, we had a counselor, again, <coughs> trying to uh, serve the Indian and, and uh, treat us well. She wanted to, to uh, make sure that we went to a college. And you know, we're living in Arizona and she wanted to send us to uh, Kansas. Uh, mm -hmm to Haskell when Haskell was a junior college. And there was no way that a, a, a family like mine would <coughs> go that far away. So I didn't go, I stayed nearby. And um, uh, again, all these kind of odd experiences along the way, because you know, you're Indian, you're poor, you're, you're rural. And for us, we were, we were also considered migrants because of the type of labor that we did, which was seasonal work. Um, and so college, um, because again, we were rural and maybe living out you know, in, in a rural setting, there was funding for uh, families of um, that kind of setting. And so I was eligible for, for funding uh, as a migrant worker, as a rural migrant worker. And that's helped to fund part of my, my college, early college experience. And the whole notion, and which is a whole long story as well that I don't want to get into now, uh, is just why, you know, I, I ended up going, going to college. Um, but <clears throat> going to college, uh, the experience initially was very, very interesting because the first people that we met, I don't know why, it just seemed that way. Some of the first faculty that we met, or maybe they were looking for us or looking at us as well, were the anthropologists. There was, and the University of Arizona, there, a lot of the anthropologists there, a lot of their early work was on Southwest tribes. They, you know, that whole university has this huge uh, reputation because of the archeological and early uh, ethnographic work that was done on the tribes of uh, Arizona, Southern Arizona in particular. So there were quite a few researchers there that, that had done work on, 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 uh, on my tribe. And so we just kind of ran into each other or else they, you know, they found us and there weren't that many of them uh, at that campus anyway. And so we found each other. And so we had these early contacts and with them, they led me to um, what was there about our tribe, the literature, the research that was there and then that was there at that particular campus because the work was done there as well. And so as a, as a student, I had the opportunity, of course, to be able to access a lot of these things. And a lot of these things, some of the practices that I know my parents knew and that you were, that I wasn't supposed to be accessing because I'm either a woman or I'm too young. Um, it was there, but it was there in print. And some of it was there in the language as well. There were some linguists or anthropologists actually that had worked on the language very early on and they collected a lot of things in the language. And those things that were collected in the language were very good. They were quite accurate. And I would check out those documents and I took them home to my parents. And I was, I was hesitant to show it to them um, because I wasn't sure what they would say. And so I finally showed it to them. And this was one, one particular book that was on a ritual that's from both my parents' home village. That's a very, very uh, important ritual. And this little book described the whole ritual and even had photographs in it. 
And the book was published like in the 1930s. And I took it home and my mother and my father and a couple of my uncles were happened to be there and I showed it to them. At first I got very upset because it just bothered them that, that it was in a book. And then they started looking at the pictures. And even though the, all the ritual dancers, they had these masks on, these ritual masks on. After a while, my mother and my uncles started looking at those pictures and the dancers were all men. And they got very in, involved in, in, uh, in looking at the book and they started naming all the people in in the photographs even though the people had masks on the way they knew who the people were was the position they had mm -hmm. in the line dance which is something that anthropologists did not so like, <laughs> so so i learned something by taking something home in that way and accessing it and a lot of Autumn language was in that text as well because, you know, some of the ritual phrases and words and things like that were, you know, written out. And um, I couldn't read Autumn at the time, um, but later I figured it out and I'd asked my father and he kind of explained it to me. So my early exposure to the documentation that people had uh, produced on Autumn, I accessed when I was like, 19 and 20 years old and again it's just an unexpected um event in having a part or participating in language work by others and we can be critical but then there's sometimes there's some good things there and I found it, like I said, in linguistic documents, ethnographic work, also in literature and poetry. And, and you have to be everywhere. You can't, you know, just be looking in uh, linguistic textbooks. This, this part was a, a very significant um, part of many of, uh, especially educators, language educators work. Montana, the Crow people had Crow friends back then. I had some, um, uh, what the other tribes um, that were very, very active in schools. Same thing in the, the Southwest and all across the United States, very active in schools where they were using schools to promote, to reinforce language and culture. And you know, so you know, you had that earlier discussion about teaching Indian history in the schools. This era did that work very, very well. The reason they did that work very, very well is because in the case of some of these schools, they were controlled by the tribe. And so the tribe said, you know, what will be in the classroom what the curriculum content will be the cultural and linguistic or language content what will be and they had committees that uh, oversaw all the content so for accuracy and appropriateness and relevance for different age uh, groups and development and anyway so these guys did this very very well and uh, a lot of them were had different types of funding um, and this was the whole era of bilingual education and multi multicultural uh, education. And this, at this point, I was in graduate school, and some of this work helped sort of set me in the direction of being a teacher, a language teacher for language teachers. That is, say for instance, if you have a bilingual school or classroom on the reservation, the autumn teacher not only has to be a speaker of the language, but they also have to know how to read and write. And so I got those teachers in my classroom. So my first autumn language um, uh, classes were speakers. 
all I had to do was teach them how to read and write. And then they, they were back in the school. And this happened all across the United States. And that's why you have a generation of people that retired just a few years ago and the rest are retiring right now. And those were your first or early um, bilingual uh, teachers. And also at that time when I was in graduate school, the Language Institute that uh, Jesse mentioned in my introduction um, was started and it was primarily to support the language teachers that were in the school. So at this point, people across the United States and probably Canada as well, were using schools as the vehicle for promoting uh, language in a lot of different ways. And then something happened. The politics of the country, the politics of states, and the language started shifting really quickly. I mean, we saw this in Arizona, and it was kind of almost like overnight. And probably the same thing happened here in, in Montana. You know, you had languages, language communities where the children in the 1970s and 1980s, children were still coming to school <coughs> speaking a lot of the language. So you still had bicultural, bilingual classrooms for them. By law, you had to have them. And and then there was this shift, you know, started moving uh, away from the language to English. I mean, that shift was always happening for a lot of different reasons, economic reasons, um, uh, family reasons, you know, um, the boarding school trauma, you know, where your parents, if they were um, victims of that trauma and they did not promote the language in the family. So those shifts, you know, shifts were happening already. But at this point in time, it happened, started to happen much faster. And some people blame technology. Technology being television. A lot of Indian families didn't, you know, we didn't have TV for a long, long time. And there are some places that were getting television. Some places that used to be inaccessible were getting, you know, access through satellite, uh, VCRs, and things like that, videotaping, and, and so on. So they were accessing English more readily than ever before. Um, but there are also lots of other things. There were also policies. There were policy movements in the United States and state by state. And the Southwest is notorious for this. Uh, you had the English only movement in the 1980s that was very, very effective. And it's still ongoing now. And that impacts policy in school and um, anything that's uh, funded by the state or the federal government, depending on the laws. The impact of things like that <coughs> were tribal language policy and then of course the very famous Native American Languages Act, NALA. So any of your language programs, your tribes have ever gotten funding from uh, uh, AMA grants, uh, it's because of the Native American Languages Act. Um, tribal language policies also were put in place. A lot of them were sort of feel-good policies. They didn't have much, don't have much teeth to them, but they're good to have um, um, to enforce um, other areas of, of language uh, when a tribe has their own, own policy. Um, so many of us that work in language, we were all involved in all of this uh, activity. And so that's just a real quick window on that. And then of course, with that huge shift happening so fast, we have the term endangered languages. And I, let, I tell the story of how the term endangered languages or endangered got placed on language. And this was occurred at the end of the 1980s. Um, our friends from Hawaii 
were in Arizona, and they had just made uh, Hawaiian official language of the state. And in our discussions about the Native American, what would become the Native American Languages Act, we were trying to figure out terminology that would be catchy, you know, that would bring attention to Native American languages at that time. And so we looked at the, the, the uh, documents that are out there, have been there for quite some, some time on endangered species, endangered species act. And that's for animals and you know, plant life and so forth. And how valuable people see animals, plant life, and how you move to try and, and save those things or create new settings for them so that, so that they thrive and support them. And the federal government and the state government can put funding towards those kinds of um, uh, activities. And so we thought of, of language in that context, you know, that it can become an endangered item thing because you, you can't go anywhere else in the world to find, you know, the autumn language. You can't go anywhere else in the world except, you know, the Four Corners area to find, you know, Diné or Hopi, Paiute, Black Crow, you know, any of you can't go anywhere else. There's the only place. And so when it's gone here, it's gone for good. And the same thing, that's how they think about uh, plants and animals. Um, and so you want to protect them. And so our discussion led to that, to, to use the term endangered languages. And, and uh, that was the term that was first used as we talked about the Native American Languages Act that became policy. And if you don't know um, the Native Language Act, the Native American Languages Act, if you don't know that document, I would strongly encourage that you you get to know it. Not just if you're not because you're a student, but um, for anybody as a community member from a tribe, because it can help you not just regard to language, but education, um, cultural protection, and so forth. So it's a good document to have in place. Um, as we sadly, you know, are in this, at this point of having nearly all the languages of the United States considered endangered, you know, people have created different ways of trying to deal or accommodate it. And I just list a few of them here. And I know, you know, the different tribes here in Montana have a lot of these in place or have to try different ones. And the thing is, there is no one approach, you know, that will work um, for everyone. Um, right now, we have strong evidence, of course, for language immersion. Um, that it is the method that will actually produce a speaker if you do it right. Okay, that's the trick to it, if you do it right. Um, all the others are all, you know, uh, different types of, of approaches for promoting and trying to create uh, speakers. And different ones work um, for different <coughs> situations and so forth. Um, so this is where we're at now, these different methods, and then different spaces for those methods. Schools, some that are charter schools. Charter schools are very active because you have a certain amount of control for these charter schools, and so you can promote language and culture uh, at some of these uh, charter schools. Certainly tribally controlled schools um, uh, have been very effective but they have huge challenges of the ones that we are familiar with. Um, also, many of these efforts are uh, uh, take place in the community. 
at the tribal community level. Um, and some are tribally supported, some are not. Um, and then of course there's ones where people just take it upon themselves to do something. You know, just one person, one person at a time, two people at a time. And that's fine as well. We've seen some of those efforts um, being very successful over time. Um, <clears throat> So when I just want to end with um, the understanding that everyone has something to contribute to whatever the effort might be with regard to, to language and whatever the goal might be for language. And of course, you know, your primary players are going to be the speakers. And then people will always question, or else people who don't speak the language will doubt as to how helpful they can be in language recovery, language maintenance effort. And I think that they can be very um, helpful uh, in those uh, settings as well. So you should never turn away, you know, those people who are um, not speakers of the language. And then there are those uh, in some of the literature that call it remembers. And there are the people who know a lot. They remember a lot, but they can only tell you about it in English. And even though they tell you about it in English, if you put a person like that who only talks about it in English in a group of speakers, the speakers sometimes don't remember everything, you know. Yeah, everybody can't know and remember everything, and that's why it takes you know different people to to uh, um, sort of help bring things together. So when rememberers sit around and bring up things, and even though they're talking about it in English, the speakers it'll trigger something, you know in the language and it'll help you know bring that back and so um speaking about things in english and helping it revive you know kind of pull it out of somebody who is a speaker is um very very effective and it makes it a safe place for everybody to participate you know for non-speakers to participate and be part of that kind of of dialogue uh, some same thing with young people young people uh, who may or may not be speakers, they ask questions, you know, so they ask questions that adults and especially speakers of the language might not think as an important question or relevant question. So when they ask questions, it again supports the overall uh, effort. And of course, um, you know, you have any number of researchers out there and the number of fields. So, well, you know, we heard a range uh, earlier today, the different backgrounds that people are, are coming from. Um, I think if they're the right kind of researcher, you know, people who want to share it and people who are interested in doing quality uh, work and willing to work with, with um, community people and so forth. Because not all researchers want to do that. That's not what they do and you shouldn't uh, expect them to. Sometimes you can re-educate them and and uh, they'll be, you know, more beneficial. But anyway, so you have to be, you know, careful and, and selective about, you know, the different types of researchers that you want to um, you know, where you want to take advantage of the type of work that they do. And I've known some, you know, excellent partnerships and collaborative work by uh, non-native researchers and tribal language efforts or community language efforts. So anyway, so it's, you know, it's a system. And there are many others as well. I just only listed a few uh, examples here. And, um, and then I just close again, going back to my, my own family um, and just sort of relate it back to the 
the journey that I've had and the journeys that our family has had with regard to you know, really the literal journey, you know, moving from one place to another to live. Um, and then the journey that they've gone through with language, um, something that's parts of it that was unintentional. You know, they were just speakers. They were talking about language, talking about songs, um, remembering things, reinforcing things for each other. That was important to them. And they, of course, were unaware that because it was not their intention, I don't think, um, that their children, you know, myself and my brothers and sisters, that even though we were just sort of hanging out on the edges, playing probably, we absorbed a lot of what they had to say to each other. And a lot of it, you know, certainly shaped the way that we grew up and the way that we, <coughs> We think about ourselves in the way that we know uh, who we are, and and then of course uh, it helped to uh, instill you know that language and and some of that knowledge within us as we grew up, and so uh, it's not easy. It wasn't easy for our parents to force themselves to remember, especially when they had to work so hard physically just to to make ends meet, you know, every day. But remembering things, practicing things had to be done. And so like, that's what I mean by being hard work. And, <clears throat> and, you know, they were good at it. They were good at it for, you know, their whole lives because it was important. And in the end, the way they did things, the way they practiced the language, the way that they talked about the language, helped each other, uh, taught each other things. To me, they were good guides for us. They were good models for us. And you know, and that's something that, that families can do. And like I said, that's certainly what they, they did for me and my uh, brothers and sisters. And you can still, you know, this can still happen, even though the language might be limited in the family, but to um, to use what you know, you know, and um, sort of continuing uh, to build on it. And, you know, again, like I said, it's not easy work. And um, in the end, your children or the people around you that hear you, you know, uh, it's good for them. It's a, it's a good model, just like we heard this morning, to uh, other people being examples for for each other. So I'll stop there and we have a minute for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, and especially um, the remembers. Um, so often in our communities, our older ones don't want to share their stories because they feel they have nothing to contribute. But there's an incredible richness in them telling their story because then it brings up, like you said, all the hard work that they have to do just to get where they are. So mm -hmm. I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. And then the other comment I want to make is, in Montana, we don't have charter schools. It's a big political debate how we best to comment on that. But that's one of the things we don't have here. It's the charter schools. Arizona runs rampant with charter schools. Too many of them, and some of them are not very good. It's a double-edged sword. Um, so, like I had mentioned earlier, you know, I'm kind of new to the whole implementation of overseeing this conversion school, and um, I'm actually an educator, and um, you know, I've taught for the Brown University for 10 years, so I do have an education background. Um, I am currently an administrator now, so I'm, you know, pretty embedded in, in terms of education, and um, 
looking at things from that perspective. And so kind of coming here, um, you know, I wanted to take from this as I was kind of reading through some of the things that were presented. Um, things that would be beneficial to me because I know that you know, going up against you know, revitalizing the language or whatever you want to the term you want to use to protect this language. And you know, taking this job now of kind of overseeing this um, immersion program is a couple of obstacles here. And I know my um, I actually have my immersion teacher here and we talk about policy and you know all of our schools, um, most of the schools that are not making adequate legal progress based on the whole child left behind are either on or near reservations in the state of Montana. So a lot of these schools are basically under the microscope right now in terms of making you know, that academic achievement, which most of it is in English. And um, one of the things that, you know, that was, we're kind of walking this fine line right now as we're implementing implementing this immersion program in public school is that you still have to need accreditation for the state of Montana in terms of your educators being certified to teach in the content area and then most of our speakers not having that um, degree to be teaching the content areas outside of the language and I know reading um, a little bit of research that Idaho you know there uh, Fort Hall, they decided to do this too, and they were running into the same problems. And just, you know, it, it's great. We still have people, you know, that we, that I guess want to learn the language, but in order for us to get it to our students, you know, we have to speed up that process. You know, people in this room, you know, that we want to start getting the language back. We need to start focusing with those younger kids if we need to get those of you who, you know, regardless of your age, to go back and you know, learn the language, because I know most of you are speakers, but you know, go out and get your education to become educators, because that's where you're going to make that difference and bring it back to languages in the classroom right now. Because right now we're struggling with that. Um, we do have you know educators who are teaching the language but are not able to teach content. And then on the flip side of that, because we are a public school and we do have these certain policies that we do have to abide by, um, we don't have the resources available in Blackfeet and we still have to teach this curriculum and meet these different standards, but we don't have the resources available. And I, I you know, kind of was interested too about the teaching aids and stuff like that, you know, because I'm I'm on the ground level, I'm on the battlefield right now trying to get these students the resources, trying to get my staff the resources, and it, it, it's a struggle. Um, we don't have posters, you go in, I actually oversee kind of the Native, um, Native American Studies Department, or Class 7 teachers in my district, and you go into their classrooms and they'll have pictures and even everything's handwritten. You know, we don't have the nice resources or the I was able to visit Pax's dual elementary, um, dual language school, and they have posters and everything in Spanish. They have books, and we don't have that. And you know, and there's no market for it because you know, textbook companies or other companies aren't going to want to just make a few hundred copies. You know, they want the hundreds of thousands. And so, those are some you know barriers that we're working through and um, trying to you know connect with different people in our community to get all these unique. resources. So. You know, those are the two biggest um, barriers that I'm, you know, dealing with right now and trying to get this going in our school district right now. And um, just, we're talking, you know, with the community college and they're trying to offer some kind of language classes so we can speed up people to get class sevens. Once they get the class sevens and, you know, pushing them through to get the, an elementary certification so that way we can use those people. But um, you know, I mean, and it, just myself, you know, going in now and observing what's going on in those classrooms. Because, you know, if you don't have people in positions that monitor, you know, what gets monitored gets covered. What gets, that's what gets taught in schools. And so if you have, don't have those people who, you know, the workers you talked about or those people that want to put that hard work in that go in and are, you know, seeing what's going on in that classroom, you know, it's just, I feel like on the reservations right now, because of No Child Left Behind and making AYP, you know, those things important because there's money tied to that. 
There's people that come in and observe your classroom. Um, some reservations, they take over. You know, the state comes in and takes over. So, you know, those things are kind of getting pushed to the side in terms of language and whatnot. But, um, you know, so I've been able to go in and observe. And, you know, they're actually doing really great things there. And um, I have, you know, my own kids that are in our district. And, uh, not really paying so much attention to that, but having my son come home and tell me, you know, this would mean, you know, that would mean, and he didn't say it because he's actually taking this one. He took Miss White Knight's class and he picked up a lot in that class. And, um, you know, making that, you know, a priority. And, you know, most of you probably have kids or grandkids and different things in education. So, you know, it, it's important for you guys to, be, you know, go out there and voice that to the people that are making those decisions, your superintendents, your building principals, and not only that, but just, you know, if you have that strong desire for our language to continue on, then, you know, we have to start educating our youth, and if that means you have to go back to a teaching degree or work on a teaching degree or work on, you know, learning the language, then, you know, I encourage all of you just to pick up that cross, because that's what needs to happen if this is going to come back and you know it's it's nice to you know say this is dying but you know i i'm at that point where i'm trying to act you know i'm trying to i guess problem solve and come up with solutions and so that's kind of just me on my little soapbox but i mean there's everything that you're talking about you know from the policy level and things that you know you guys have had to go through and um, but you know really it comes down to getting your, I guess, just getting in there and putting that work in there um, in order to bring this back because, um, like I said, I'm new to this process and, you know, there's just so much disconnect and, you know, until, you know, you or your family or whoever that's close to you takes up that and gets in there and, like I said, I just encourage you to stay, you know, get on the ground level and start working up because, you know, it's pretty tough and it's pretty frustrating and um, I can attest to that because I, you know, listen to different people and um, I see it firsthand. So, um, you know, just get your class seven license, get your teaching license and go back in the classroom and teach. You know, age doesn't matter. <laughs> just get in there and, you know, make that difference, make that choice. Continue this. That's kind of my, my little spiel for you. Mm -hmm. I was, well, the comment that was made on YouTube about the, uh, you know, the disconnect among what's going on in language, language activity, <clears throat> even within a within a single language, the, the the situation that you're talking about has always been there. You know, not having enough teachers, qualified teachers, certified teachers, you know or um, to be, especially in the public school um, setting. Um, as long as I can remember, and that's always been an issue. And it's sad that it's, it has not um, been fixed at all. One thing that I noticed mm, in the Southwest, <coughs> with, in particular with our tribe and, and Navajo, for instance, just because they're two of the largest language groups in the state, um, they had a pretty substantial number of uh, speakers who were certified teachers and were in the school. But in the last five years, that whole group was retired. And there was nobody that came back. And so those classes just phased, phased out because no one fit in. Right now, I know New Mexico, I think, is the state that started it. Arizona now has it. And I, know, I know other states have it as well, where the State Department of Education hands over the responsibility to the tribe to, <coughs> to certify speakers to be only <coughs> language teachers, not other subject areas, just language teachers. And um, New Mexico's been pretty effective about certifying 
for the Pueblo, you know, uh, groups and Apache, Southern Apache groups um, there, and some of the, the Navajo in, in New Mexico. Uh, Arizona, uh, some of the Apache groups have, have been uh, creating their certification programs for that. We have been working on ours as well. And uh, we had some ladies who had been teaching language for like 20, 25 years. And they, you know, they were saying things, we're not gonna go back to school. We can't go back to school, we're too old, you know. And so for them, they were very happy that this certification by the tribe was gonna happen. But they were so close to retirement that we sort of grandfathered them in even before the the certification exam was done or finished. So we have about half a dozen autumn language teachers who uh, are certified by the tribe and the state. You know, if the tribe certifies them, the state will accept their certification and they can be in um, the public school, but only for language and culture teaching. And like I say, I know a number of tribes uh, have that in place as well, but it is a slow process to get through because it is um, um, has to be set up by the tribe and be approved by council and so forth. So we've been working on ours for about two, two and a half years. So it is slow. Um, but yeah, but your your situation there, like I said, um, it, the case has always uh, been there, not having enough certified teachers in the classroom and um, it's right now it's it's not clear why I mean even just teachers in general uh, I noticed that our university that is native teachers we have very few native teachers that are in uh, our college of education that is as students to become uh, certified teachers it's just not a popular field or another. Um, and, um, and I can see where it would be even more challenging to get you know a mature adult into that into a, a program to become a certified teacher. So it is very challenging. And one thing I know that our tribal college did was um, they created a two and two program. So and this was for teachers to get all of them uh, teachers as certified teachers. And so they started, they did the first two years at the tribal college and then transferred <coughs> to the university and they moved as a cohort. And so they had, they graduated as a cohort. But it was a, a huge grant, so they, they had they were funded for four years. And that's about the only way you can get somebody through is with full funding. And it even included because they, these were mature more mature people, um, they had families, and so some had to move, you know, to the city to finish their second two years. Some commuted, and so you had to accommodate for their commute, child care, a stipend, or whatever. Um, so it's doable, but it's it's a huge investment that somebody has to make. And so we've, we've seen it, you know, try your hand be handled in different ways just to get a, a small group of tribal members through a degree program. And tribal colleges have have been helpful in that way. That way those students start at home and then only in the last two years do they have to become away. But it is it's a challenging situation. I don't, know, I don't know if anybody has any other experience or <coughs> recommendations to that. There are some ways that other cities are potentially trying to get around the financial issues. Um, I'm not referring to the native language studies, but the city of Boston, for example, um, they hire people for, um, the city hires people that are community leaders, they have staff management positions, they call community 
budget for the year would have some turnaround. And, this, and with certain number of positions within the city and able to work in schools, I worked in a school for two years um, as a community advisor coordinator, and I was a teacher. I do not have a coach in Massachusetts. I have a coach in California, but it didn't matter at all. So my point is, is that um, and as hard as it is to deal with the state bureaucracy around credentialing, um, it is probably unfortunate that you know a lot of older people that are qualified to teach these classes are never going to get credentialed. Like, you're called to have these people come to school. It's very unlikely that you do that. But uh, on the other hand, you know, hopefully, administrators and people at the state level maybe could also try to get around the credentialing uh, issue somehow, like the city of Boston has. You know, they, they save quite a bit of money in doing so. They can pay, they pay less than a credential teacher. You know, I did the same job, you know. Um, and I don't know if there's any room, I don't know enough about it, but I don't know if there's any room within the BIA regulations and maybe special um, exemptions they might get yeah, I know that this is probably pretty, pretty tough to deal with in terms of state bureaucracy, but you know, going, going forward, we know that really there's only so many older people that can, that can do this, and they don't need a credential. You know, obviously, you know, I'm not saying anything uh, mind blowing. They don't need a credential. What they need is the state to be able to say, You go do this, and that's it. So, hopefully, along with people. Go out and give them their credential, you know, administrators and the state bureaucracy, and maybe federally there could be some movement in that area. So, Celia, what strikes me too is how, well, I, first of all, um, I'm actually from Arizona more than Montana, but um, I'm really impressed with what the state of Montana has done, like you mentioned, compared to Arizona, yeah. which is really awful. <laughs> um, but I'm really struck by the changes over time that seem to be going backwards so many places. So, you mentioned Rough Rock and uh, Wallapai and the schools. That, there was also federal support at that time mm -hmm. uh, under Title IV. Yeah. To, teach native languages and cultures in public schools, which you don't see now. I'm sort of wondering what he was saying about advocating for more federal support along those lines. If there's any, anything going on, or is anybody trying, or uh, I mean, uh, building it maybe on the Native American language, or right. something else that would push for support at that time. Mm -hmm. It won't happen in Arizona. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, so speaking of school and schooling, uh, I have some literature up here um, from, from our campus. I know this is a perfectly good campus here too. <laughs> Excellent programs. But if you want to, if you ever want to come down south, <laughs> um, we have a, a master's degree in Native American language and linguistics, which is an, an excellent program. Um, and we work, in fact, one of our glitter pieces says uh, something about um, that, um, that there's no ideal background or age limit for our program. So, you know, we take what they call non-traditional students. Um, and, and we've been very fortunate in this master's program to get older adults um, because they are speakers of the language and they want to work on their own language. And so it's been very, very good for that. And we also have had people who are second language learners of their language and they want linguistic skills so that they can better access the linguistic literature that's out there to help them, you know, work on their own language or study their own language. So anyway, so that's our master's program. And then the other one is just a report on our language institute, our annual report on our language institute, and then some bookmarkers from our, our language institute. And if you ever feel like coming down and um, spending the summer with us in Tucson, Arizona, we're there every June running our, uh, our language institute, and it's a lot of fun. Um, 
So anyway, so I'll leave, leave these out uh, for the rest of the evening, and then of course tomorrow I'll have them here again as well. Oh, oh. I'd like to thank the, the students for this beautiful bag that they made one that's too pretty to use. I'm going to use it. Thank you very much. It was made by uh, Michelle Guzman, who's the uh, NAS advisor. So if there's any orders that need to be placed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just a few closing announcements. Uh, anybody who is looking for the higher education forms, they're at the front desk. Uh, the paperwork is there to fill out. It'll be there tomorrow morning as well. Um, there might be some coffee left if you guys want to get around after this and network a little bit. The purpose of this meeting is to get people engaging with the, each other and engaging with some of the presenters. So feel free to hang around and visit for a little bit longer if you'd like, if there's coffee available. Also the raffle tickets and shirts are still being sold in the front. I'd like to close today with a prayer from one of our speakers and presenters of tomorrow, for, uh, who will be presenting tomorrow. Uh, the speaker comes from uh, the Sinaboyne tribe, Ani on the um, Fort Belknap Indian Reservation here in Montana. I'd like to introduce Kenneth Tuffy Hagelson for the closing prayer. Really, really beautiful to be here with all you good folks today. I'll just, uh, first of all, apologize to the elder folks. I don't mean to offend anybody, but they always say you're doing the best you can when you're asked. And I want to thank my brother for asking me to pray. So I'll ask you all to pray along with you. I de wakai kanga necha pa fele ya de bi niu hara oko no wincha kia. Ae bi ne hano ya de bi ne no to kanga bi che niu hana daya kibish de niu hana nakoni a bi che chawo kaga bi siye. Ne o na ga ha ake je ste na amo wa ste o bube te ne o ya de bi do ken te hano mani bi siye niu hana tibi ni tawa niu daya kibu ya che chi ma chwa ki. Ne ga ne hano shi ni a bi enwa che ge chamu. Oh, my Father, I thank you for this beautiful day that you gathered all these beautiful people here today and I ask that you bless us each and every one here tonight. And wherever it is we come home, we come we come from, I ask that you bless our home fires and you keep them burning bright. And when we get back there, that they're better than when we left them. Wherever we go this evening, that we have a good rest and we gather back here tomorrow and learn lots. Stay tuned until we get up and stay tuned. We'll see you all tomorrow at 9 a.m. We'll have fried bread. I'm <laughs> <laughs>